Amen. Tonight I want to continue along that theme. I'm coming toward wrapping this up, but we're talking to, actually when you're taught these areas, you're really talking what the Bible calls eschatology. It's called the doctrine of last things. That could be the rapture, the um, judgment seat Bema, and then the judgment seat great white throne. Also the judgment prior to the millennial reign of Christ, which we'll touch on tonight. And this theme of judgment runs all throughout the scripture. But I want to begin tonight with uh, John 5, verse 22. And if you turn there, we're going to talk about the judgments that are, that are in the Bible. Amen. Some are already past. Some are current. Some are still ahead. Amen. So, and so this issue, you know, it really it carries a, a theme throughout scripture. And there's nothing for us as believers to be afraid of because now that we've already been judged for our sins, through the cross, amen. Because of that, we're not going to be judged for our sins in that respect, amen. But we'll be judged for our works, and accordingly, we'll be rewarded in Jesus' name, amen. So when we talk about biblical judgments tonight, and then different judgments that are in the Scripture in general, amen, there's a person that all judgment is committed to. That person is Christ. So let's go to John 5, verse 22, and uh, he's appointed by God to... Be the judge of all things. Amen. Uh, John 5, verse 22. Let's read. Um, beginning in verse. Yeah, let's start reading with verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father had life in himself, so hath he committed to the Son to have life in himself, and had given to him the authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So the authority to judge how many things? All things are given unto Jesus. But the issue is why? You know, why is he the righteous judge? Amen. Well, we know it's because God appointed him so, but notice the last phrase in what is written there. As it pertains to mankind, our lives and our sins. See, he's talking about the hour coming when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and shall live. Amen. So this is after the resurrection, isn't it? And then the Father had life in himself. His Son has life in himself. Given, it says he given to the Son to have life in himself, but also gave him authority to execute judgment also. Why? Because he is the Son of of man. See, the one Jesus who created all is the one who judges all that he created. Amen. Sometimes people wonder why, you know, uh, Jesus was the person in the Godhead that died in our place. Well, he's the one that made everything that he is. Amen. And so Paul says in Colossians that all things were made by him and for him. And by him all things consist. Amen. And being the author of creation, when creation sinned, he also became the redeemer of his creation to buy us back and bring us back into relationship with God. So he came legally through the virgin birth, being born on earth through the womb of a woman. And the scriptures say here he has authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Amen. Hallelujah. So I guess when we think about his things, the price that he paid to redeem us. You know, Jesus, he is the son of God in him. But forever, he's a man too. In other words, he changed who he was for you and I. It's a sobering thought in me. And he still bears the scars for his redeeming us. He said we are engraven in his hands, didn't he? The Bible says when he returns and the nation Israel saved in a day, they'll look on him, Zechariah 12, whom they have pierced. The eternal God bears the marks in his body of his love for you and I. He said, handle me, thrust your hand into my side. That's the resurrected Christ. Mm. See, we don't think about what he, you know, sometimes it's like he died on the cross, but he still bears the marks of what he did to redeem us, forever changed. Amen. 
Matter of fact, 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, what, there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. All authority is committed unto him because he is the son. Amen? In other words, the father of creation becomes part of his created man in order to redeem created man and then to spend forever with us. See, God's whole plan when it comes full circle is there be what they call a joining together of both heaven and earth. You know, and that's why in the end, saints, you know we don't stay in heaven forever, right? But in that how we've been taught most of our lives, you know, our whole goal is to get to heaven. But, you know, but in the end, basically heaven comes to earth. It won't be this same earth, but all things will be new on it. Amen. And so God said it, and New Jerusalem is going to descend, and then the tabernacle of God will be where? With men. Amen. Now, I'm, you know, I'm sure heavens will still be there as they are, and, and, you know, but God's dwelling place will be here. I'm sure we have access to all of it. Amen. You know, at some point, we're going to go back and do. I saw, a, a, and I don't want to get into it and take up time. Back to this. Amen. So the judge of all is going to be Jesus, isn't he? Let me give you another scripture on that so you won't, well, it won't look like I just picked that out. Amen. But um, in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, if someone's beat me to it, you can read it. Romans 2, verse 15. You know, sometimes it would benefit us to kind of stop and think, you know, what he paid for us. I think one reason why we don't seem to appreciate our salvation as much, we don't really think about our salvation that often. See, we think about the benefits of it. Amen. But we will appreciate it more if we understand the cost. Amen. Notice 2 verse 15. I got it. Y'all didn't read it. <laughs> Let's read it together beginning with 15. Let's start with 14. For when the Gentiles will have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts to meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Amen. That kind of settles it, doesn't it? So God is going to judge the hearts of men by Jesus Christ. But notice it's according to the gospel. What's so unique about that being according to the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's by this gospel that we're saved, isn't it? And so if he's going to judge us all according to the gospel, the basis is our response to the message of salvation. Whether we responded in faith and were saved, whether we rejected the message and were not. By the way, in this text, there's no excuse for anyone. And so we also see here that even those that may not have heard the gospel message as you did, the standard for them would be the obedience to what's written in their heart, the law of the conscience, isn't it? So if you really wonder, what about those that never heard? They'll be judged. Their standard may be a little different. But the Bible lets us know that God will reveal himself Paul says that in this same text to those who are really a seeker of the truth. Amen? And so, and so God is able to manifest himself, amen, you know, to them if they seek him. Amen? But the standard of all judgment we see again is going to be Jesus Christ in it. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Amen? And so that's always been the case, amen. And so, but judgments aren't something new. Judgments in relation to our salvation began with Christ, prophesied prior to his coming, but there are other judgments beginning in the beginning of the book, the scriptures. And so what we're going to do is do an overview of judgments in the Bible, amen. And then we'll maybe touch on the cause of it, and each judgment bore a punishment, amen. And then there are um, those, that category that I want to labor, judgments that are past, and the reasons why, and then current judgments. You know, there are still judgments we're to make concerning this life while we're here. Amen? And then there are judgments that are yet ahead for us. 
So that's why I say a bird's eye view in a sense of judgments in the Bible because just, just to judge is simply to render a decision based on evidence, isn't it? We all make judgments. Amen. And nowhere are we told not to judge. Amen. The Bible says judge not lest you be judged. Amen. In other words, you're not told to judge. Then Jesus says in another point, when you do judge, judge righteous judgment. Amen. And then he gave us a basis for different types of judgment, the fruit that an individual bears. You know, oftentimes we make judgments to determine who we witness to, don't we? Amen. If they don't uh, display any mannerisms that are consistent with uh, Christianity, then you make a judgment call whether they're saved or not in your mind, right? Amen. Based on that, we decide whether we're witness to them or not. Now, sometimes people got this holy righteousness that seems about them. They may not be saved. They're just clean living. Well, we might make a judgment call that, well, they seem to be all right. They say they believe in God. Amen. And so you make a judgment. So making judgments are not uh, something we are prohibited from doing. Condemning one another is the condemnation. Amen. You know, because a tree is known by the fruit that it bears. That requires judgment, doesn't it? Amen. You know, Paul judged a young man in the book of Corinthians in the first chapter. He said, the sin you're doing is not even named among the Gentiles that a man should sleep with, you know, yeah, that was incest. Amen. But he said he judged to turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, didn't he? In order that they might be saved. In other words, that was a judgment, wasn't it? Amen. A decision rendered based on the behavior that was evident. Amen. You know, so judging in wrong, amen, in that respect, when we judge righteously. Amen. Hallelujah. And people will hold us under condemnation when we begin to actually, well, people know sin unless you preach sin. No. Paul said, I'd not known, amen, except it was preached. Amen. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, isn't it? Amen. And so we have to tell people the bad news. And this is where we miss it oftentimes, I believe, in American gospel. Because if they don't know the bad that they're living and involved in, you know, then what do they have to repent of? If we're all good people. When the Bible says in Romans 3.10, about us, there's no none good, not one. Amen. You know, so our standard of goodness when we believe we're good people is us. We judge ourselves good. Amen. Now, now, if we compare ourselves to a holy and righteous and just God, no matter how good we look externally, we're not good. Amen. Because even the cleanest living people among us, they can be full of pride over how they live it. And they judge other people because they don't attain to what they have. Uppity. <laughs> you, know, you know, whatever the term is. But those are judgments, aren't they? But when we compare ourselves to the holiness of God, none of us can attain that standard. We all fall short of that mark, don't we? Amen? So before a per person really sees a need to repent, they need to know what their problem is. If we don't preach what their problem is, how are they going to know? Especially in this society. Amen? So judgments then. We need to make those decisions to judge and judge rightly. So going back to the book of Genesis, the first judgment is one that's already happened. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Now remember, judgments are decisions rendered based on behavior. Every judgment looks at a cause, and then based on the cause and the action, there's a judgment or a punishment rendered. Amen? Now, remember the righteous judge is the Lord, isn't he? Amen. And so when we go back to Genesis, uh, in particular Genesis 3, verse 15, what we call the fall of man, that's the first judgment in the, in the word of God as well. Now, the first judgment in Scripture is an all-inclusive judgment because this judgment doesn't just involve rebellious man. It involves all of nature and creation. Amen. Now, in order for our redemption to be full circle, that means both man and creation must be restored. Hence, Jesus bore the curse. Getting ahead of myself. But go to Genesis 3, verse 15. Now, notice in verse 14, serpent, we know, we know the account. 
Satan appears to the woman in the garden disguised as a serpent. And the Lord said unto, Lord God said unto the serpent, after the fall of man, you know, so we won't read all the background. We know this, that man listened, first she did, and she, through being deceived, acted in disobedience to God and then turned to Adam and gave him the fruit, and he ate. Amen? And after he ate, the Bible says their eyes were opened. They literally, you know, <laughs> went from life to death, in essence, and they became aware of themselves. Amen. Before the fall, man wasn't self-aware. He was God-aware. Amen. You know, and the Lord could come and talk with man in the cool of the day, no pretense, face to face. And then after the fall, the first thing man recognizes is that his light has gone out. Amen. You know, um, a lot of people believe that they were, sh they were really clothed in the Shekinah glory of God. Amen. But whatever happened in the fall, they knew there was a change. And when God came, the response is not to draw near, the response is to draw away. Amen. And so Adam and Eve had themselves, and then they try and make their first covering, fig leaves, to cover themselves. And notice in verse 14, God pronounces upon the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and in dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Amen. Because of that, amen, that uh, sin, the judgment that comes upon the earth, I say it is inclusive. Amen. What are some of the things that you would think came upon the earth because of Adam's sin? The elements, our environment then. Okay, the nature of what uh, something went from the envi environment eventually affecting our, uh, yeah, what, what we eat. Okay. Uh, huh? Our nature went from uh, one of having fellowship with God to broken fellowship. That's the main um, because as a result of Adam's sin, Adam being what we call the federal head of the human race. Amen. His sin nature passed down to all men. Amen. And God establishes that in Genesis chapter 1 with what we know holds true even now concerning all things reproducing after his kind, Genesis 1, 11, whose seed is in itself. So the seed of a man who is now in separation from God, calling to reproduce through woman, a seed born in that same spiritual condition, separation. So man's fellowship, broken with God, and passed down through the generations, Romans 5, 12, so that all have sinned. Amen? Mm-hmm. Amen. The nature of work changed, didn't it? Work wasn't designed originally to be a toil. The earth was designed to freely give us increase. And so when you begin to read through here, notice the first one he mentions to the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Yeah. Now, if, if, if there had been no fall, I'm sure Eve wouldn't have had morning sickness. <laughs> Labor would have been effort, wouldn't have been labor, labor's work. I didn't experience the work, but I watched it. I watched it hard. I watched the monitor. She had to tap me because I was going, oh, here one coming. But that wasn't the case, wouldn't have been the case had not man fallen. So uh, pain and conception and childbearing, a result of, so man's sin resulted in separation. The judgment was upon man in labor, amen. And then in woman, we see here, even when it came to child rearing, and in sorrow thou shalt uh, bring forth thy children. And we can catch from the next part, somebody read that, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. Okay, so there wasn't an issue of headship like we see it now in marriage until after the fall then. But also a conflict in that, 
He says that desire shall be to her husband. It literally means her desire would be to overrule him. Hence people say, you know, yeah, he the head, but, you know, the neck turn it. Y'all heard that. That's the attitude. And so there's this not a, uh, a, a, a divine, you know, relationship where there would have been a natural setting in the, in the marriage where there wouldn't have been a conflict between who's head and who's not. That's the result of the fall we see here, don't we? And it says, he shall rule over thee. And if the Adam, he said, because you listened to the voice of thy wife and ate the tree. Cursed is the ground. So now we see the effects on nature. Amen. The sin was disobeying God. The punishment affected our fellowship as a race with God. It's broken. And it affects our marriage in the sense of what our offspring uh, the pain, pain in bringing forth our offspring, and now on the ground there's a curse. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Amen. So environmentally, the nature changed, the plants changed, thorns and thistles began to grow. You know, you know how would that have been? Imagine that. All of a sudden, you know, you're holding a rose and thorns pop out. You know, see, they weren't in the first creation. Amen. These things came about as after the fall. And so thorns and thistles came, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and sweat of thy face thou shalt thou break, eat thy bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Amen. The pronunciation of death, physical death, after the fall. See, those are judgments, aren't they? There was a warning not to do this. Because of it, there's a pronunciation of judgment. And the judgment was instant. It affected all of creation, not, not just Adam and Eve. And, hmm? Uh-huh. Romans 8. Amen. Go ahead and read it. Waiting. Amen. So there'll be a restoration, but all creation suffered in the fall. So that's judgment number one. Amen. The judgment on mankind and nature and the promise of a future restoration is there, but everything around us has been affected. Judgment number one. Amen. Judgment number two is in Genesis chapter six. Now the term that theologians often use for that is antediluvian world, but it just means the pre-flood world. And so the world after the fall begins to manifest the nature of the people that are in it. And so very quickly after the um, fall of man, you know, we have the first murder with the first two kids, don't we? Amen. And from then on, it just gets progressively worse. And so you get to Genesis chapter 6, and what do you see happening? Amen. You see it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Amen. You had this intervention of what is called the Nephilim demonic intervention into the uh, human race so as to corrupt any potential avenue for the promised seed to come. But wickedness is spreading all over the earth. Verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was very great in the earth and that every imagination, every imagination, somebody say every imagination, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They woke up evil. They thought evil during the day. They drank evil at night continually. They just scheming evil stuff. Now, what does the Bible say about our day? As in the days of Noah. Amen. And so we shouldn't be surprised then. Amen. Now, also, during the days of Noah, there was experimentation with gene lines and with genetics. Guess what? They doing that now, too. Amen. And because of what was happening in the earth, Amen. God pronounces a judgment. Anybody know what that judgment is? Well, that's the punishment. That's the result of the judgment. Amen. Huh? The judgment was the flood, wasn't it? Now, what's the purpose of the flood? Huh? To destroy all those who were in rebellion and only what? Eight people spared 
who were righteous in their generation. They were unsullied or not contaminated by all the genetic manipulation that was going on. Only eight people. Amen. And so God built an ark, a type of Christ. He told them, build an ark. That's a type of deliverance. Amen. You know, and so that's a type of Christ being manifested. But when they went in the ark, the world that they saw after the ark was different again. Amen. And so because of that judgment that came upon that world, all of mankind was destroyed except Noah and his family. So the punishment was for sin. Amen. The consequences were the flood. That was the judgment. As a result of that judgment in the flood, just like you said, Sister uh, Cheryl, life, uh, man don't live so long. When you get to Genesis chapter 9, we find that there's a change in the earth again. Not only nails are producing, you know, thorns and thistles, uh, the very context of the earth has been changed, amen. You know, when you read about the fountains of the deep being, you know, we think about rain just coming down. You know, Santa says, there's still a lot of water in the crust of the earth. Amen. But the earth literally recracked, amen, and, and water would gush up as well as the firmament, which was water gushing down. The entire earth was changed during the flood. So the pre-flood world that Noah stepped out of was entirely different from even the firmament most Christian scientists believed looked much different, or the sky as it were. Because under that canopy that was above, you know, most, I love ones like Dr. Carl Body said, it was probably like a pinkish hue. Now it's blue. Amen. But now you don't have protection from ultraviolet rays and gamma rays or anything else that comes from the sun. All creation was changed, y'all. You know, in a perfect creation, the sun wouldn't have sunspots. See, we don't think about the far-reaching effect of Adam's sin. Amen? The earth didn't experience rain until that time of the flood. Prior to, a mist watered the face of the earth. So you had weather, but there were no extremes in weather. All those are bad products of this judgment that came upon the earth. So now Noah enters a world where he clearly sees the differences in the seasons. Amen. There wasn't any, been any snow in the, pre, in the pre-flood world because the earth was watered by a mist. Amen. You know, uh, and so everything has changed after the flood as a result of it. And then an increase in the shortening of the lifespan of man. After the flood, God said, then the life of a man is what? It's down to 120 years. Amen. Noah still lived. It took, it took, it took some hundreds of years, a couple of thousand years for men's lifestyles to really get down to like we are now. You know, but those were judgments, weren't they? Amen. You know, that wasn't the only Old Testament judgment. It just seemed like man just keeps going from judgment to judgment. And God is showing us just how rebellious we are. See, that's one of the things that the Old Testament reveals when we look at it. Lest we feel like we can't reduce back to that, we need to keep cross in sight. Amen. And remember who he's made us to be. And as long as we're in this flesh, we can still regress back if we don't hold fast to his truth. See, all these things are written for our examples, aren't they? To warn us, hey, that we don't go whoring after false gods like they did in Genesis 6. That we don't listen to whatever serpent in Genesis 3 that comes our way and whispers a lie in our ear. That's the lie of every false movement. You'll be as God. The new age makes you gods. Hinduism worships hundreds of millions of gods. Amen. And so, you know, but you'll be as God if you go through the cycle of life over and over and over to get to that great big nothing where you become one with the universe. That is not good news to pastor. Amen. I'm going to work and come back a hundred times just so I can be nothing. You know, but that's what the New Age promotes, Oprah. Amen. Y'all still love pastor. Amen. But there's another judgment, and it's still in Genesis. I think God's trying to show us something, that as humans, we don't get it. <laughs> Amen. You know, you know, when we look back in the history, the best predictor of our present and future is what we've done in the past. Amen. So what we've done is repeat certain cycles of sin over and over. Third judgment, somebody guess. 
Babel. Amen. And so what leads up to disjudgment? Amen. And so because it goes back to Genesis chapter 1. You know, and so you can see like a subplot written in that God said, listen, you do certain things and I'll bless you. And so now the earth is going through the judgment of sin and now through the judgment on all creation, through the flood again. And now man is still not doing what God told him to do. Amen. So what did God tell man to do? We find that in Exodus. Amen. <clears throat> not in Exodus, I'm sorry, but Genesis 11. And so God had originally told man to, in Genesis 1, 26, I say to 28, to be fruitful multiply, replenish the earth, and so do it. We were told to go out, weren't we? Amen. But we find by Genesis 11, after they began to repopulate the earth, that rather than expand over the earth, man has a tendency to uh, concentrate things back to themselves, and there's a reason why. Why do people like to cluster together when God wants us to spread out? Starts with the P power. Amen. And so people like to concentrate their ability to rule and control where they can. There's the same move in this nation today to concentrate all power into just one area of government. That's been the history of humankind. And it eventually leads to dictatorships. And so we have this happening in Genesis chapter 11. Notice verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly, and they had for brick stone, brick for stone, and slammed the head for mortar. And they said, Go, let us build us a tower, and whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be what? Scattered abroad. What did God want them to do? Spread abroad over the earth. What do they want to do? Concentrate. In that plain of Shinar, so that they won't be scattered. So this is an act of rebellion against God, isn't it? Amen. You would think after the flood and the legends of the flood, and, have, and some of these people now, you know, they knew folk that probably died in the flood, that they would obey what God said. But no, they want to concentrate back again, and so they want to make a name for themselves so they wouldn't be scattered. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of them built. And the Lord said, the people is one. They all have one language. And this they began to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined. Amen. You know. Well, the one that led that was Nimrod. His name means we will rebel. He was a rebel. He was also a son of Cush. The man who was behind the introduction of the first pagan religions in the earth was a black man. Amen. And so that's nothing to be proud of there. Amen. Yeah, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Amen. Known to be a cannibal. Amen. And practices curious arts. Amen. He said witchcraft. The mother-daughter cult, Semiraisis and those, they trace back to this area, Babylon. Amen. Where these religions were introduced. Now notice, they began to concentrate power going against what God said. And so God comes down to see, and he says, let us, he's judged them. God said they're one. And so God's judgment is that nothing is impossible that they can do. So if they want to build a tower that reaches into heaven in their rebellion, God says, they can do it. But the punishment is what? Somebody used the word a while ago. Babel. Confusion of language, wasn't it? Amen. And so he said, let us go down and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. That ought to tell us something today. Now, you know, we're actually coming back to a place now where we're becoming one in speech. Do you know they have software now that can translate what others say in another language so you can understand it in English? Oh, yeah, the translators they use in Star Trek. We got them. We got them, don't we? Amen. You know, and so if we come together for wicked intent, it's still possible that we do it. Man won't quite get to that point before the end. Amen. But notice that punishment was confusion of language. And notice verse 8, after that, 
So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence from all the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. What stopped it? The judgment was a confusion of speech. Their unity was in one language. As a nation, that should tell us as long as we have one language, we can be a united nation. When we begin to do like they do, you can't buy nothing there without it being in a bunch of languages. That is what they call the vulcanizing of a culture. When you break up into different language groups, guess what? You cease to be a united country, and people begin to build their own separate, distinct communities as they are in Michigan and Detroit, and as they are in other parts of this nation, and the nation eventually crumbles. See, we're on that same course now. So you can actually go back. This is why we need to read. See, there's lessons here that will help us in our current reality in 2017 if we'll learn the lessons of the past. Amen? And then it wouldn't be an issue about which language ought to be number one in America. It ought to be English. Amen. You know, it shouldn't be a vulcanizing in Nevada. I mean, why? Because it weakens the ability of the nation to stay together. Hmm. That's simple when we think about it, isn't it? Amen. So Satan works to do that. But he, here, here we find that as a result, they scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. They began to go out, as God said. So now they went based on language. So I guess the people that spoke Swahili, they heard somebody else speaking Swahili, and they said, hey, let's go down this way. And, or somebody else speaking English, and they went somewhere else, and somebody else speaking whatever dialect. But they went to different places of the earth. And if you look over a globe, people of certain dialects tend to gather in certain places. What drew them together? Language. That's another bad way proof that this word is true. Hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. So third judgment, still in Genesis, was the judgment at the Tower of Babel. The punishment was dispersal. Amen. The next judgment, still Old Testament. Amen. Once again, they all prove the depravity of man. We are lost. We need a Savior. <laughs> Amen. And we always regress to a worse common denominator. And so when you go to Exodus, amen. Chapter 7 to 12, you fan the judgment of, mm -mm. who that? Egypt. Amen. Egypt is a type of the world in the Bible, isn't it? Amen. So um, Abraham grows into a, um, a, a nation, amen, but they're not a whole bunch of them. But there's a famine in the land, and Abraham, amen, and Isaac, and then Jacob, and and so they're a small band, about 70, the Bible says, isn't it? Well, because of the famine, we know what happened with Joseph, amen, and he sold into slavery. And so the nation then, because of God exalting Joseph and using him, that's in Genesis, you know, going around 40 to in and at the 50th chapter. God exalts him to prime minister, second in the command, to the Pharaoh, right? So they go down a small people. Amen. But when you read Exodus beginning with the first chapter, you find that the women are lively in their birth. And there arose a Pharaoh who knew not the God of Joseph. And they began to be, be afraid that what would happen? There would be more Israelites and they would overtake the nation. So, so fear is driving this. And so what did they begin to do to Israel? They began to persecute them. They began to say, look, you know, every male that's born... You got to kill them. <laughs> and so basically, God provided a deliverance through Moses, that means out of the water. Because they saw he was, what, a, a, a nice child. They hid him in an ark. Another type of deliverance again, isn't it? Amen. And he was found by Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's house wound up winding the one, raising the one that God would use to bring that kingdom down. <laughs> Amen. But there's a different aspect to this particular judgment. So the judgment of Egypt was not just on the nation, it was on the nation, but it was also upon the gods of that nation because they had an opportunity to know the one true God, but they live in paganism, and they actually have one who is exalted as God, who's a man titled Pharaoh. See, the Pharaohs were worshipped as gods. They lived and died like everybody else, but, you know, they said, look, we gods. Um, but um, they were no different. And if you study it out, the plagues that came on them were on those things that they raised and elevated to a place of 
godliness. They, you know, they worship the bugs, the scarabs, the frogs. You know. Well, all those things were judged worthy. And so in Exodus 7 and 4, there were mighty acts of judgment that God sent against this nation because, I don't want to give away the cause quite yet, yet. Notice verse 4, it says, But Pharaoh shall not hearken to you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Amen. So God is going to judge this Egypt and the king and the idolatrous people. Amen. Now, what caused the judgment of Egypt? Because it's going to be consistent from this point on. Here in Exodus, you're going to find the first judgment of a nation. Yes. That's a cause, but it goes even farther. Now, think about it in terms of Genesis 12, 3. Whosoever blesses God's people, he will bless. Whoever curses them, he will curse. The unique thing is the first time we see clearly in history that the blessing or punishment of a nation tied to the treatment of God's people. And so, huh? It's the same today. See, that's why I said once we get it established, Old Testament, it's consistent, y'all. It doesn't change. Amen? Because our punishment or blessing today is based on our current treatment of national Israel as well. Amen? And so, and so here's this Pharaoh here in, in, in this nation, and they're beginning to oppress the people of Israel, and they begin to cry out to God. And when God appears to Moses, he tells him, look, I've heard there. Here, here's something you got to like about God. Before we go to chapter 7, go back to Exodus 4. This is where one of my first messages I ever taught or spoke came from. It was called, what's in your hand? <laughs> Amen. You know, because God came to Moses. <laughs> and God came to him. And Moses answered and said, they won't believe me. And the Lord said, verse 2, what's in your hand? A rod. Well, we know what God did with that rod. Amen. But God called him in chapter 3. And God told him that he would go and deliver his people. And so that was the call of Moses or Moshe. Amen. God even spoke in chapter 3 that he would give them favor when they came out that he would bless them as they left. Amen. But God called them, called him to deliver his people. Amen. But the funny thing about it, God said, I'm going to deliver them, and this is consistent. Verse 7, he says, And the Lord said, chapter 3, I've surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, and I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good land and large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. God said he's going to do that, didn't he? Amen. Now, therefore, behold, the crowd of children of Israel has come unto me, and I've also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee to Pharaoh. <laughs> See, it's still the same. Amen. If God's going to do anything in the earth, guess who he wants to use? You and I. That's consistent, isn't it? Amen. And so God says, I'm going to deliver them, but I'm going to send you to do it, that thou mayest bring forth my peop people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Amen. And Moses, you know, he's humbled at this point. Who am I, Lord, that you can do this thing with me? Amen. So the punishment upon the nation Egypt, amen, was upon their gods and their ruler, the Pharaoh. Matter of fact, this Pharaoh, God knew, would harden his heart, amen, but, and that he would bring the judgments upon the nation based on his own stubbornness, didn't he? And so in Exodus chapter 5, amen, when Moses went to him in Aaron, he said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, verse 1, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Wrong statement. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I know not the Lord, neither will I let the people go. He set the stage. 
by his own arrogance and disobedience that brought the judgments of God upon the nation. So because of their arrogance and idol worship, God judged the nation, but the intent of the judgment was to bring out his people. Amen? And so God brought them out through those judgments. Amen? And the reason why they were judged primarily, the oppression of the people of God. Amen? And so, and so, we see these occurring in the Old Testament, and we can find others, I'm sure, but not in this extent where they just jump out at you. Amen. But um, the next is an area of um, judgment, our current sins. That's not a past thing. So we see the past judgments here, but in a state where we will call our current judgments. Amen. These are judgments that are in a personal sense. We need to make judgments. Remember, judgment is what? To render a decision based on evidence. Amen. God rendered judgments on these nations based on the evidence that they were in opposition to him upon Adam because of disobedience. Amen. And on um, the antediluvian pre-flood world because of their insistence in wickedness and Pharaoh in Egypt because of idol worship and idolatry. Amen. And oppression, not oppression in Israel. Now we find as individuals, Guess what? There are judgments for us too early. We talked about the Bema Seat judgment, so we're not going to spend time on that. Amen. But in addition to the Bema Seat judgment, amen, there was a judgment, and this is a past judgment too. I would say not current, but past. The judgment of the sins of the believers. Okay, what do you mean past that they've been judged? They've been judged already. The issue is when were they judged and for what reason? Amen? So if I were to frame it as a question, when were our sins judged? Y'all know the answer. Amen. Okay, so the place of the judgment is the cross. Amen? The purpose of the judgment is substitution in it. That the sins do us, or we committed, would come on Jesus at the cross. So he would exchange by the offering of his life, his righteousness, and take on our sin. And we could receive his righteousness and be delivered from the penalty of our sin. He did no wrong, but he suffered as a wrongdoer. He never sinned, but he suffered the death of a sinner, didn't he? Amen? So at the cross, it became the place of substitution where the prophesied punishment on, uh, of the world, and not just our sins, but all of creation, Amen. And then the separation that came between God and man, by which God said that the seed of the woman will uh, crush the head of the serpent. Amen. What well, a seed of the woman is Christ, who's now on the cross, suffering for your sins and my sins. And so God is laying on him, Isaiah 53, 10 says, the iniquity and sin of us all. At that one point in time, in history, on the cross. Amen. And this is where our sins are judged. At the cross, amen. That's a past event, saints, amen. In other words, when we get saved, we receive forgiveness of sins technically. We ask for forgiveness even though we are really already forgiven, amen. In other words, all the actions of sin that we would ever commit, every sin we would commit, say commission, amen. Every sin that we would ever do, ever think, amen. The penalty came on Jesus at the cross, Amen. And that's why Luke 24, 47 says that repentance and remission of sins be preached in his name. That's why Colossians 2, verse 13 says, amen, having forgiven past tense our transgressions on the cross. Amen. That's why in Luke, uh, John, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 8, where he says, when he has come, he will reprove the world of righteousness and sin and of judgment of sin. Why? Because they believe not on me. The thing that sends a person to hell now is not what they do. It's their refusal to call on Jesus. Jesus paid the price already. Amen? I'm going to read it. Amen. And, and so that's really, in a sense, that's absolutely unpardonable there. Well, when he has come, 
Amen. You know, that's John 16. What did I say? I said 8. John 16. Notice this. Verse 8, when he has come, he will convict or reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go unto my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. We'll come to that in a minute. But our sins are judged at the cross. Hebrews 2, 9. Could you read that, Sister Cheryl? Hebrews 2, verse 9. And I'm going to look at another scripture. Hebrews 2, verse 9. And so that was at the cross, wasn't it? Amen. So he's already tasted death for every man, tasted separation for all of us. Colossians 2, verse 13, I want to make sure I, I don't want to misquote that, but <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, it says, And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your, of your flesh, had he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. See, that's that Calvary, isn't it? That's where the blotting of, out of the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us, took it out the way, nailing it to his cross. See, that's the tragedy when people who are already forgiven, that's why I often say there's no such thing as, you know, they say I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, I'm a forgiven sinner. You, yeah, before we got saved, we all forgiven sinners because we've already been forgiven. The problem is we don't receive the forgiveness, and therefore we don't get the salvation. Amen? See, that's why Romans 8, 1 could say, when we come to Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Jesus bore all the condemnation. But if we don't receive Jesus, then we receive the punishment because we rejected God's remedy. No other alternative we reject God's only way of salvation. So that's a past judgment, isn't it? The next past judgment was still in where we were reading, where were we at before I went to Colossians? We were in John chapter 16. Turn back there. That old devil's been judged already too. In other words, God has looked at the evidence against him, rendered a judgment. Sentence has been passed on Satan. Notice in John 16 how Jesus framed this. He said of judgment, verse 11, because the prince of this world is. See, that's a present tense world word, isn't it? Well, it's not present tense 21st century. It's present tense when he said it. He's judging Satan. Amen. You know, he said at the same time, he's talking about us and our sins. Amen. He said the prince of the world, who is the cause of the sin in the world. Amen. He's judged. And guess what? Through the cross. Jesus paid for our sins, but he also, 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. And so we know that when he died, the Bible says he descended. Amen. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 says that he overcame principalities and powers, having over or, or defeated them, and that was through the cross and his death, burial, and resurrection. Revelation 1, 18, he says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of hell and of death. Amen. Well, who had the power of death? The devil. The Bible says that through death he destroyed the one that had the power of death. That's Hebrews 2.14. That is the devil, and free those who all their lives through fear of death were subject to bondage. See, once we're no longer afraid to die, you can't bind us anymore. Amen. And so Jesus, through his death, his dissension, and his overcoming principalities and powers, judged Satan. Well, pastor, if, if the devil's been judged already, why is he still running around? Why isn't he locked up? Hmm. 
help a pastor out. Why is he? You know, <laughs> he's been judged already, hadn't he? Dispensation? Uh huh. Okay. Okay, well, we'll come to that. But you know, the simple answer to that is think about court for a second. You know, you can be guilty of murder. Okay. There's evidence, you know, you got, your, you know, the one that murdered is the defendant in me. And, huh? And then there's a plaintiff in that case or a defendant. Okay, so evidence is presented. Based on the evidence, a judgment is rendered in me. Okay, so if the person is in, in, uh, innocent, they would be justified, not guilty. But if the evidence and the preponderance of it say it's guilty as charged, and let's say it's a capital crime such as murder, they can have a judgment of death. Do they instantly die? No. They're under sentence of death. But guess what? Now, in our, nat in our legal system, depending on what representation you have, you can have a sentence over you and not even be incarcerated until you come to the final sentencing. You know, so someone who, who has committed a horrible crime, they can be free awaiting when they have to go turn themselves in or be led in and then taken to prison. I like to think about Satan that way. He's already been judged. The sentence is pronounced on him. Amen. Matter of fact, the Bible records his final punishment, doesn't it? Amen. His final destiny is going to be the lake of fire. Amen. And prior to that, he's going to be bound for a thousand years. Amen. Incarcerated, as it were. But guess what? He's under the threat right now and the penalty of it. Oh, yeah, it looks like he's running around right now, but it's over his head. So he knows he doesn't have but a such amount of time. And what is he doing? Seeking on the man God's plan in the earth. But his day, his final incarceration and punishment is coming. So he's been judged guilty. The judgment has been pronounced on him. Jesus said the prince of this world is judged. His final sentencing is still a future event. Until that time, we have to deal with what he seeks to do on the earth, but we don't do it from a place of weakness. We resist from a place of power. Amen? Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Right. Actually, he may not even leave when you ban him because he knows I don't know what I'm talking about. Because I don't have a scripture. The Bible tells us, yeah, you can ban him. It's Jesus who deals with him from that point. You know, because Satan is in hell now. You know, so how can I send him where he isn't or hadn't been? He's the prince, Ephesians 2, 2 says, the prince of the power of the air. He's still operating in the second heavens around us. And so we ban them. We cast spirits out. And the Bible says they walk dry places seeking rest and find none. So I don't have to ban the spirits. I command you to go to hell. Just cast it out. Jesus knows what to do with that spirit. What we ought to know, though, 
is that that spirit we cast out is going to try and come back. And the Bible says he found that house swept clean and garnished and not defended because they ain't got the armor on. They don't know how to resist the devil. They don't know their authority. They don't know who they are in Christ. And Satan comes back in and brings the same thought and temptation. And they go, I thought I was delivered. You are delivered. But you got to resist. And when you submit to God and resist, he has to flee. But if you don't resist and flee, guess what? He'll bring in more spirits, more wicked than and your last state will be worse than the first. So I think Christians get sidetracked when we try and command where we command them to go. Our job is to take authority over the spirits and cast them out. Amen? We're given that right, that power. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name cast out devils. But you know, the Bible doesn't tell us where to cast them to. Now, you could command them not to come to your house. <laughs> Amen. You cast them out. Amen. But, you know, you didn't worry about trying to send the devil back to hell. You, you know, the Lord will handle that part. Amen. So sometimes we get these things confused. But we got God-given authority. Amen. So he's been judged. He's under sentence. His final punishment and being blocked up or incarcerated is coming first for a thousand years. After that, forever and ever. Amen. Judgments in the church age. Let me move for the sake of time. Amen. So those are past judgments. Satan's already judged. Our sins are already judged. Current. Amen. There's a, a self-judgment. This is where a lot of Christians miss it. Amen. We don't judge ourselves. Now we make evaluations based on others. One of my favorite sayings is this. We judge others by what they do. We judge ourselves by our intentions. We say, I, I meant to do well. Yeah, but you didn't. You did wrong. Amen. I'm only human. See, that's not a self-judgment. That's a self-excuse. So if you do that, you, you're covering your own, you, you're kind of blinding to yourself, and you'll wind up paying the penalty for bad choices. Amen. The reason why we sin is not from our reborn human spirit. The Bible says his seed is in us, and we cannot sin. So when we sin, we don't sin because through our spirit, that sin comes through our unregenerated flesh that isn't born again yet and our unrenewed man doesn't it amen and so when we recognize that we do have a sin nature and that we have a, 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 a tendency to fall into certain areas of sin because we are growing in the Lord amen and um, we're learning as we go but we're not there yet we won't be there till Jesus comes Amen. So that means from time to time, we need to evaluate ourselves to judge whether we're in the faith or not. See, that's what 2 Corinthians 3, 5 is saying. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. So we need to evaluate ourselves and make self-judgments. So if I'm making crazy decisions as a Christian, and I'm trying to justify them with me being a human. I need to judge me as being a sinner in that area. Amen. And then take corrective action through repentance. Amen. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight puts it this way. It says, um, but let a man examine himself. We, 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 we do this every communion. Um, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eat it and drink it unworthily, eat it and drink it damnation to himself, not discerning the lower, Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves. See, that's our current judgment, isn't it? Self-judgment, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So we need to judge ourselves from time to time, don't we? Amen? You know, we need to check ourselves. Give yourself a check up from the neck up. You know, we don't think right all the time, do we? Amen? We don't act right all the time. You know, we find ourselves drifting into certain thought patterns. We need to adjust ourselves, don't we? You know, if we had time, we could go to Matthew 18 and look at the area of the church involvement in judgment among believers. Amen. That's church discipline. You know, if you got a problem with a brother, go to your brother. And if they repent, you've won your brother. If they don't repent, you go to somebody else in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every truth shall be established. If they don't repent, then see, that's judgment ended. Then you go to the church. And if they don't repent, 
then that person may come to you as a heathen and a publican, sinner. See, that's how the church should handle problems among themselves. Amen? And then there's the discipline of the Lord. That's a current discipline as well. Amen. The Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he chases. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two. 32. Amen. So if we be without chastisement, the Bible says we are bastards, illegitimate children, doesn't it? Amen. Now, God doesn't chasten us with sickness, disease, and cancer and that type thing. It's the Holy Spirit, amen, convicting us of our sin. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. So God disciplines us because he loves us. So we need to judge ourselves when we miss it, don't we? Judging yourself is not condemning yourself. In other words, you don't get a stick out and beat you. God, I'm sorry. I just keep blowing over and over. Just, Lord, I'm sorry I blew it. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Amen. I received the cleansing power of the blood as I turn from this in the name of Jesus. Guess what? He restores my righteousness, and, and there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And um, we're about to close, but, um, well, clocks are not my friend. Amen. But <laughs> I mentioned these, and we'll pick up on a future judgment on last week, next week. Judgments in the future. Amen. We know the tribulation period is a judgment. Next week, we'll touch on the why. Amen. And the outcome. And we're not going to touch so much on the judgment seat of Christ. We've been through that. But the basis is our works in the body after we're saved. Amen. And if we judge ourselves, we can have a better time at the Bema seat. Because self-examination will purify our motives while we did what we do. Amen. One we'll spend time on next week is in what some get mixed up. There's two discourses Jesus gave. One in Luke and one in Matthew, one pertaining to the rapture, one pertaining to the millennia. People get them mixed up, and that's why a lot of people think we go through the tribulation. But Jesus did talk about coming out of that period in Matthew 24, what we call the sheep and goat judgment. We'll take a little time with that. And we also see a consistency between how God judged Egypt and how God judges nations coming out of the tribulation period and our present age going back, actually, based on the treatment of that nation, Israel. You know, we'll spend a little time on that one. And then there's another judgment that um, I will say, and I'm not going to tell you what that judgment is. I'm going to lay this out, though, so you can check, that may have a lot to do with Satan's hatred. You, we wonder why the enemy hates us so much. It may be rooted in a judgment that's yet to come. Amen. So search it out. We'll discuss it on next week. Amen. I think when I begin to think about it, there's, mm, that could be a reason why there's such a hatred against us. Sometimes we wonder why Satan hates us so bad. And we already know some reasons. This could be a major reason as well. We'll look at that next week. And then the great white throne judgment. That's the final judgment. So we'll touch on those next week. Right now we'll stop for the sake of time. Amen.